Good morning. Um, my name is Sarah, and I don't usually do the sermon on Sunday mornings, and I might not have met you, so I wanted to introduce myself. Um, my name is Sarah Sigmund. I go to church here. I have for about 20 years. I'm married. I have two kids. They are 10 and 8. I do not work here. Um, I work at a school. I've been teaching in the public schools. I just finished my 16th year, and I still love it and think I'm really lucky to have that job. I like plants, coffee, and books. I dislike long walks on the beach because I think the sensory experience of sand in my toes is disgusting. I dislike mushrooms and coconut. New this week, I found out that I hate painting furniture. And if you like painting furniture, I am really happy for you because you are going to be able to make your house look beautiful and fresh on a budget. But whatever money I saved, I think I now need shoulder surgery. So that's where that's going. Um, I also, last thing, I don't like the months of January and February. I think no matter where you live, there are two stupid months. And where we live, it's January and February. The weather's awful, the holidays are dumb, and this January, it just rained the whole stupid month. So it was gray and cold and you can't go sledding in rain. So it was terrible. And on a Sunday afternoon, towards the end of January, I texted my friend, Laura, and I said, do you want to go to Garden Factory with me and go seed shopping? And she said yes, because she knows what desperate sounds like. And normal people don't go seed shopping in January. So she and I went on a Sunday afternoon, and we went through all the seed packets at Garden Factory, and she stood there with me and discussed the merits of the different seeds. And she did not buy any, because she's not insane. But she was a good friend to me. And I bought a packet of Snapdragon seeds, and I started them in my kitchen in a little washed out strawberry container from Aldi on a TV tray by the window. And they sprouted and they grew. And eventually when spring came last week, I took them outside and I put them in my flower bed and they actually made it. And I have beautiful snapdragons in my backyard. I actually took a picture for you because I mean, they look nice. Yeah. So when the snapdragons came up, I was not at all surprised to see what they looked like because they looked like the outside of the packet. Because people who garden know that what you plant is what's going to grow. And that's true when you plant your garden, and that's true when we're talking about our faith and our lives, and that what we plant is what grows. So if you haven't been here, our church has been reading the book of Galatians. We've been on the book of Galatians for a while. It was written by Paul, who was a early church leader. And Galatians has the, the theme that goes all the way through the book is that Jesus, when Jesus came and he lived the perfect life and he died a willing death, and then miraculously rose again. When that series of events happened, that made it so that anyone who would follow him would be forgiven and would be free. And that's the theme that goes all the way through the book, that forgiveness and freedom is now available to anyone who would follow Jesus. And it's the kind of freedom that's the opposite of like religious, legalistic slavery that all of humanity is kind of prone to. So we're getting to the almost the end of the book. This is near the end and he's wrapping up and he kind of brings it to a conclusion with now that you're free, what are you going to do with that freedom and all that space? I'm one of like two million people on earth who really like that poem by Mary Oliver um, called The Summer Day. And the famous lines in that poem are at the very end and it says, tell me, what are you going to do with your one wild and precious life? And I think that's kind of the question that Paul is putting to the Galatian people that were listening to this, is now that you've been given this amazing gift of being a free person, what are you going to do with this free life you have? So let's look at what he wrote about it. It's in, we're in the book of Galatians, chapter six, verses six through 10. This is what Paul wrote. 
Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his flesh, from the flesh, reaps corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are in the household of faith. So what will we do with this wild and precious gift of being free? And Paul's suggesting that we plant. The imagery of planting is helpful because it makes tangible something that we know but struggle to execute. It connects the dots between God has given us this incredible freedom, which means that we have the choice on what we do. That's the planting. The choices we make and the actions we take, that's what we plant. And then the connection between those choices and the results, what grows in our lives. And that's the imagery Paul picked because it helps to connect all those dots for us. And then he goes into, as he keeps talking in Galatians, about what to expect, like what it looks like, this planting process. So first, you can only expect to grow what it is that you planted. He says in verse seven that we just read, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. The snapdragon seeds came up as a snapdragon plant, not as a lilac bush or a zucchini plant, because what you plant is what will grow. And we can't plant the seeds in our lives of social media, a 24-hour news cycle, workplace gossip, and trash TV, and then expect that what's gonna grow in those spaces is a loving marriage and a strong connection with our kids and deep friendships and growing faith. The imagery of something planting and then growing is helpful because it just gives a visual to something we know. What we put in is what's going to grow. And so then spiritually, what is actually being planted into our hearts and our minds, what's being planted into our faith. Are we finding ways to plant the true things that are in the Bible, the true things about God and about life and about our world into our hearts and our minds so that they can grow? Um, and there's actually a lot of ways to do this. I'm a morning person. I know there's three of us here. Um, but I'm a morning person and I get up early and I like to do Bible study books. I buy them on Amazon. I have a couple authors I really like and that's usually what I do. I know a lot of you participate in the small group Bible studies that happen at church here and that's the same idea. There's usually a Bible study book that you're doing at home and then you come once a week and you can talk about it and discuss it with other people. Those are gonna start, um, they'll probably start putting them up in about a month. I have friends who prefer to um, listen, like, they, like the audio, and I have a lot of friends who use the app Through the Word, which is a free app that reads Bible passages to you if you prefer to process things audibly. And it also has like teachings that connect to it. And then I have a lot of friends who listen to podcasts and they recommend um, one called The Bible Project which I've never listened to, but I've heard is really good. Because it's not really so much about like how you're planting the Bible into your mind and your heart. It's what we're planting in our mind and our heart. And that we're finding some opportunity to put into, into ourselves the true things that are in the Bible. Because we can only expect to grow what it is that we planted. Another thing we can expect you can expect to get tired and frustrated. Um, in verse nine of what we read this morning, Paul said, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. The snapdragons that I planted, the same day I bought a packet of Sweet William seeds because my son's name is William, and I thought that was cute and it was gonna be adorable and they were gonna grow and he was gonna feel really loved. And I took a picture of them and how they look today. 
they're dead. Um, and and that, that happens too, because there are some real life situations where I put the best of myself into something and nothing grew. And I tried to be loving and careful and patient and what I got was rejection or heartbreak. And then I get questions like, did I do this wrong? Did I fail at this? Is the Bible telling the truth? Why isn't this working for me? Or because I am a limited person and I can't see underground, maybe it's just not growing yet. So there's a lot of books within the Bible um, we've been reading Galatians, but one of my favorite books is in the Old Testament, and it's called Ecclesiastes. And if you've never read that book, the repeating phrase in that book is meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. So that's one of my favorite books, which tells you that I am not someone drowning in party invitations. <laughs> and I know that for many people, that book feels very discouraging and depressing. But to me, it feels really honest and helpful because sometimes that's what I see. It feels like life is really unpredictable and tragic. And sometimes even what I was caring for and what was growing gets invaded by something I couldn't control. And in Ecclesiastes, there's a section that also talks about this, about staying with it through the difficult seasons. And it also uses the imagery of planting. So I wanted to share that too. This author says, in the morning, sow your seed, and at the evening, withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. So Paul says it in Galatians as do not grow weary in doing good. And the author of Ecclesiastes says it as do not withhold your hand. And all the way through the Bible, you'll hear words like endurance, and perseverance, and they're all the same message of don't give up. And nobody says don't give up when you're going to a movie or when you're headed to the beach. That kind of language repeated over and over through scripture indicates that it's hard, that even as free people, this process of living on earth and being faithful is really, really hard. Last winter, we had a situation that lasted a couple months and the difficulty was not directly impacting me, it was directly impacting someone I love, which is maybe harder. And I was so frustrated with it because it felt so unfair to me and I felt like I had done everything right. I had been patient, I had been respectful, I had been clear and it was like smacking my head into a wall over and over and I was so tired and so discouraged. And I was reading at the time through the book of Hebrews, which is my other favorite book of the Bible. And I found this verse in Hebrews 10, right in the middle of that lousy couple months that said, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And I wrote it down on a bookmark and I used it as my bookmark all winter. I moved it between all the different books I was reading so that I would read it every day because I knew I needed the reminder to not quit, to not get weary. And that situation was really frustrating and didn't grow exactly what I had hoped it would, but I'm glad we didn't quit because something else really good grew there, if that makes sense. So there are a lot of verses in the Bible that talk about endurance and encouragement and not giving up um, you're just reading my favorite one because I'm the one holding the microphone. So we can only expect something to grow if that's what we planted. We can expect to get tired and frustrated. And then Paul says we can also expect to have a lot of opportunities for doing good. In verse 10 of what we read today, he said, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are in the household of faith. And this sometimes I think is a neglected part of conversations we have in Christianity where it gets reduced to just Christianity is a list of beliefs and you have to agree to that as opposed to Christianity is a whole life process where we know Jesus and we follow Jesus and we serve Jesus. And, and now that we follow Jesus, we are free. But what do we do with that freedom? Well, 
The most free person who ever lived was Jesus. And what did he do with his? Like he came and he served and he loved. So with ours, we go and we plant and we serve and we love because Jesus is our hero. Jesus is our example. And if that's what he did, that's what we do with our freedom too. Because this is kind of it in a nutshell, right? We didn't earn freedom. You can't earn freedom. It was given. It was a gift. In the whole book of Galatians, Paul's kind of beating to death the difference between slavery thinking and freedom thinking. Why you make the choices you make. Slavery thinking is believing that I have to do it all right because I have to please God. And freedom thinking is knowing that you are already free and already forgiven. And now you get to use that freedom to participate in bringing this mercy to other people. We don't serve because we have to. We serve people and love people because we get to, because we get to make that choice because we are free people. And when you go to serve people, you will find that the needs and opportunities are limitless. You, however, are not. And being committed to doing good does not mean that you are gonna be able to meet the infinite need because you are a finite creature and you're gonna have to make choices about what good things you can be involved in. So when it comes to processing the opportunities that God provides for us to do good, I'm gonna share with you how our family thinks about it. And if you don't like it, you can throw it out. That's fine, it doesn't hurt my feelings. Um, but this is kind of how we've learned to think about it right now. So it starts with opportunities to do good at home. I kind of think about it as expanding circles. So I have opportunities to do good at home and that's where it starts and that's the hardest one because it's the most repetitive and you get the least compliments for it. Um, if you're married, that would be the inside circle. What are we actually planting into our marriages versus, versus what we're expecting to grow? Are we planting time and are we really actually paying attention to the people who live in our house? Because attention right now in this culture is the most valuable currency. Your attention is worth a lot of money to advertising companies, it's worth profits to businesses, and it's worth the health and growth of your family and your faith. Broadly speaking, what, you're paying, what we are paying attention to is what we are planting. That's what's going to grow. So are we paying attention to the things at home, our marriages? And if you have kids, parenting, what are we planting into these kids? Are we planting true things about Jesus? Are we planting the kind of friendships and fun that's gonna help them grow up in healthy ways with healthy relationships? Planting conversations that affirm the gifts that are in them and give them opportunities to use it? And planting responsibility so that they grow up not limited, but able to reach the, the things that God made them for. And if you're not married and you don't have kids, you're still not off the hook because you probably have roommates or neighbors. So to close to home, there are endless opportunities for us to do really important good and to show patience and kindness every day. That's where we start. Okay, and then beyond that, after I've thought about the opportunities that God's given me to do good at home, then I push out a circle and I think, okay, opportunities to do good at my workplace and in my community. Because I go to work five days a week. Well, not right now, it's summer. But I go to work five days a week, I spend a lot of time at work. And a lot of you do too. And you understanding our workplaces as opportunities to do good doesn't mean that we're going in there thinking that we have a list of good deeds we need to accomplish in our workplaces. It's a mindset that opens up our brains and our hearts so that we understand that every person we're interacting with was made by God and is loved by God and is probably going through something that we could be offering comfort or encouragement or help. My job, my actual job is 
fractions and capital letters and punctuation and spelling patterns and helping eight-year-olds to know and understand those things. And I actually love that part of my job. It's my jam. But also, at a deeper level, my mission at my workplace is for people to know that God loves them, that I'm bringing hope into those places where I am every day. We sang a song in church a couple years ago that like clicked this together in my head. And so I went to work on Monday and I wrote out the lyrics to that song on an index card and I stuck it on my bulletin board right behind where my computer monitor is so that every morning when I take attendance, I see the kids' names and then I see um, the lines to that song. I took a picture of the board. It says, I can see your heart eight billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. Because that helps me to remember that when I'm at work, I'm doing my job, but I'm, I'm doing something else too. As a free person, I have a chance to do good in the name of Jesus when I'm at work. And then even if you don't work outside the home, you are part of a community in Chi Lai or the greater Rochester area. And there's so many people in this church who are doing good in our community. I don't know most of you unless I teach your kid in kids church, but just of the people that I know serving in our community, we have people coaching youth sports at all levels. We have people mentoring um, youth from the inner city of Rochester. We have people serving at the Open Door Mission downtown. We have people who are supporting refugees as they get acclimated to their life here. We have people in this church who are literacy volunteers. We have people in this church who serve on the Board of Education of local schools and boards of local nonprofits. And that's just what I know. But those are examples of us doing good in the name of Jesus in our community, taking those opportunities. So once we have looked at the opportunities we have at home, and then the opportunities that we have at work, because we're there anyway, and in our communities where we already live, then we can talk about um, opportunities to do good at church. And I, yeah, be careful here, because freedom thinking is I get to do something. Slavery thinking is I have to do everything. I see a need at church, I have to meet that. That creeps into church mentality, but we don't, we don't want that. Um, if it makes you feel better, I have been going to this church on Sundays for 20 years. My husband is on staff, he's one of the pastors, and I participate in one ministry, and that's it. Because right now, that's where my gifts and what I'm passionate about overlap with what our church is doing, overlaps with just the amount of time and energy I have after I've taken care of what's going on at home and taken care of what's going on at work. The amount of energy I have left is I participate in one ministry here. So our perspective at church is that you were created by God with gifts and with interests. And we have people here that you can love and serve. So if you are interested in finding out more about opportunities of how you can do good at church, there is a welcome center on the way out. It's like a little half circle desk. And they made little booklets that have all the different things that they offer at church if you'd like to get involved. Or the connection card that's in the chair in front of you. I think my kids thought that was a design your own bookmark activity for about eight years, but it is actually a connection card and someone does actually read those. And if you are interested in like just knowing about what you could possibly do at church, there's a little, you can make a note and someone from church will have a conversation with you. Because like Paul said, to take the opportunities to do good, these opportunities that God brings us at home, at our workplaces and in our communities and at church that we have the privilege of participating in with our freedom, that we get to make those choices. So we're almost to the end of the book of Galatians and Paul has established that we are free. And now we have to decide what we will do with our wild and precious freedom. 
we plant. And we accept that that process means that it's real work and it takes time. It wasn't a metaphor that was like a, an instant thing. Planting and growing takes a lot of time. That there will be difficult and frustrating experiences, but that God will give us the encouragement and the opportunities to keep going. Can the worship team come out? So I will give you an example. I started coming to the Wednesday night church program here when I was eight years old. I went to a different church on Sundays, but my neighbors came to this church and they started bringing me. I came on Wednesday nights. Back then, it was not this building. This church was meeting in a tiny little building on Marshall Road and Gates that was crumbling, probably in violation of a lot of codes. And my Wednesday night class was four little girls and my teacher, and her name was Mrs. Lean Houts. And Mrs. Lean Houts worked at a professional job all day, and she took care of her home, and she was married, and she had two kids, and she came out on Wednesdays to spend that time with us. And we had take home um, Bible reading plans, which I was inconsistent with. And we had Bible lessons, which we sometimes let her get all the way through. And she took us to retreats and she gave us pool parties and field trips. And she was my Wednesday night church teacher from when I was in third grade until I finished eighth grade. She moved up with us. I was what nice Christian people call um, precocious or spirited or naughty. And I couldn't tell you right now the main point of a single one of those lessons over those six years. I couldn't give you one. But I can tell you what grew from the things that she planted in me for all of those years on Wednesday nights. The things that became understandings that shaped the trajectory of my life. From her, I learned that the Bible was for me and that I would be able to read it and understand it, even if it was hard sometimes, and that the Bible would help me understand that God loved me and would give me wisdom. From her, I learned that there are women in church who are loud and funny and that there would be a place for me, even with my personality, which was kind of a lot. And from her and that group, I learned that I could have friends that would also do that with me, who would encourage me and love me and also loved God. And Mrs. Leanhouse for me was the 3D version of a free person who used her time and her freedom to plant. She planted so many hours of her life and her faith into my life and my faith. And then when I grew, so did those seeds. She was actually so important to me that when I got married, she was the one that read the scripture passage at my wedding. And now on Wednesday nights, I teach the little girls program and that's what I picked for my planting and my serving and my loving because I love Jesus. And because I know how what Mrs. Leanhouse did for me impacted the trajectory of my faith and my life. So while the worship team sets up, I have two questions for you to think about. First, who planted those seeds of faith and freedom for you? And then for you now, what are the gifts and the opportunities that you have at this stage in your life to use your freedom to do good for the people around you?